90.1 FM, Mount Rock, and AudioApol.com. I'm Dan with a plan, and today's plan is to have a conversation about how the ways people communicate, both in a social and professional setting, has evolved and continues to evolve. Joining our conversation today, our guest is Julie Maurer Laverty. Julie is currently a communication professor at Mount San Antonio College, the home for AudioApol.com and 90.1 FM, Mount Rock, KSAK. She's also a communication consultant who has done everything from corporate training to helping people create their profiles for dating websites, as well as owning her own interior design business. During her free time, she loves to be active, such as going hiking or paddleboarding, visiting Disneyland upward of 60 times a year, but most of all, traveling. Julie, thank you for joining us today. Dan, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Okay, so how many countries have you traveled to? I have traveled through more than 35 countries, and people would be surprised, based on, I guess, knowing me or looking at me, that it's pretty sincere traveling, like backpack full of clothes, not a rolling suitcase. I rough it a little bit more. I still hotel stay mostly, but I love to travel. I've been to six of the seven continents, so I have Antarctica left on the list, but That's in my plans. Okay. And do you ever worry that you'll end up visiting a place with food you don't like? (laughs) No. In fact, food is one of my biggest adventures when I travel. I will eat almost anything. I fortunately have never gotten sick. I have traveled with people that are more finicky than me, and they've gotten food poisoning. I, on the other hand, will eat street food. I will swallow down snails or kangaroo or alligator. I've even dined on a guinea pig. How did that taste? It was awful. It was greasy, and there's not enough meat on those little bones to be worth it. I now own guinea pigs. My daughter has them, and she has seen the picture of my guinea pig on the plate and has asked me not to eat her guinea pigs. (laughs) Okay, and was most of your traveling done in college? No, actually all after college. You know, I had this thing where I was going to go to USC. I opted out very last minute for grad school. I ended up with a bunch of student loan money sitting in my pocket, and I decided to take a semester off instead of grad school, and that began my adventures. I spent three months in Europe, and then so ever since then, that has been my addiction. And teaching is the perfect thing to feed this addiction because we've got some chunks of time off. So I've spent a lot of New Year's in other countries and some summers in other countries. So most of it actually has been as an adult, which is a huge regret. You should go (laughs) away and do a study abroad in school and start it now. What was your favorite so far? My favorite adventure was the Amazon was really rustic. It took me out of my comfort zone. I swam in piranha infested waters. It's safe unless you're bleeding. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And it was just really, really different. And I was so off the beaten path. I was really fortunate to find a place that wasn't very touristy. My favorite country, if I had to go over and over again, would be Italy or the Greek islands. But those are easier travels. I do enjoy the more rustic, like the Amazon or Lithuania, places that are more of a challenge. That's cool. So you're a communications professor. Was communications major your original pursuit? It wasn't. I was a business major because I thought that's what you should be if you wanted to work in a business. I just Uh thought, oh, Oh, well, I should be a business major. And I dreaded my business classes, most of them. And then I took a communication class and I felt wonderful. And so for an elective, I took another one. And then I ended up taking so many, I ended up with a minor in business and a major in communication kind of on accident. So I transferred (laughs) from Cypress College, which is my community college, to Cal State Fullerton and ended up getting a communication degree. But I kind of veered into organizational communication, which backs up that business, you know, experience. So... Yeah, it's kind of funny how communication majors kind of go hand in hand with other majors, right? Absolutely. I think a communication major really is universal. You can take it anywhere. It's a great general major, especially if you don't want to commit to one area. Yeah. So when you were in college, was there anything you learned that your teachers didn't teach you that you're teaching your students now? Well, I didn't think I was going to be teaching, but when I was a student, I would note things like, I will never do that to my students. How (laughs) awful. And I do watch that I don't do that. I try not to shame my students. I had a professor that shamed us. You don't know this? How dare you? You're so dumb. Like current news events or the definition of a word. And then things that I've learned that my teachers didn't teach me, like things like life things? or No, like uh, career things. Like, um, let's say uh, you said you wanted to teach or you didn't want to teach. So is there anything that you wish you would have learned in college that would have helped you? Oh, yes. I wish I would have learned early on about learning styles, more about how to be a good student. I learned that in grad school because it was a seminar I took and I thought, wow, I could have used this years ago. 
So uh, with learning styles, if a student ever complains that your test is too hard to study for, do you ever feel like turning to the evil parent and treat them like spoiled brats that need to experience it the way you did? Um, when I first started teaching, <laughs> I definitely was like, well, this is what's wrong with today, you know, in the back of my mind. But I really thought it was their problem and not my problem. The more I am growing as a human, growing as a professor, the more I say, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? I'm constantly changing things up. I just had something. I had an outline in my public speaking class. There were two classes where their outlines came in and they were not good. And the old, you know, very young professor probably would have been like, they're not listening. They're not doing their work. Uh -huh. uh, the Definitely now I go, oh, what did I do? What did I do wrong here? That these two classes, back to back classes on Monday, Wednesday, I said or did something that didn't communicate what they needed to do the right way. I have to look at me and my teaching when I don't see the results that I want to. So when you graduated, what was the first job that you got with your communications degree? Well, I didn't mean to, but I fell into teaching. So I was a graduate student at Cal State Fullerton. I was so lucky to have made that choice and not go to USC. It's a fantastic school, but one of my decisions was USC was using the books written by professors at Cal State Fullerton at the time. Cal State okay. Fullerton had the best in our field. Two of them have passed since, but one is still there. But they have a wonderful teaching program, where as a graduate student, they will teach you how to teach and they will give you classes. It's a paid job. And that's how actually I learned to love teaching. So my first job outside of Cal State Fullerton when I graduated was actually at Chafee College, my first part-time teaching job. And so I kind of went to college at 20. I started later. I had a couple years in mortgage loans. I was incredibly successful in that. It wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. um, it felt a little shady at times. <laughs> uh, you know, it taught me that the money isn't always worth it. So I went back to school at 20 and I've never left college. I've had a parking pass ever since. I fought for parking ever since. <laughs> I've used student bathrooms ever since. So basically for the last 25 years, I have been in college. Uh, you said you struggled during the first years of your teaching career. How did you overcome that? You know, the first couple of years of my teaching, I obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but if you're my student, you know, I love my major. I love everything I've learned. I'm a total geek about it. I will sit down and tell you about a theory as though it's like the best movie I've ever seen. And when I first started teaching, I thought everyone should know all that I know. And I would sit in front of a classroom for the entire time from beginning to finish and I would talk at them. And <laughs> it was, of course, then their job to be as passionate as I was and memorize it all and repeat it back to me. Well, what I realized I was doing was talking at people and I wasn't teaching them. There's a big difference. That's part of being a young teacher. And by young, I don't mean age, but newness in teaching. Right. So through the years, I have learned that the less I talk, <laughs> and the more students do, the more they often leave the classroom with, or at least they're leaving with things that are real tools that they can use. And it's been a very hard transition. And I have really forced myself, especially in the last five years, to do it more and more. So focusing on communication, uh, the biggest change to the way people communicate today compared to a decade ago is social media. Uh, so what are some ways that you have seen this positively affect the way people communicate in a classroom compared to your time in college? Okay, so this is going to date me, obviously, but when I was a student, um, I am 45. So when I was a student, it was 1994. Saved was by the bell I, years. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Saved by the bell years. You should have seen my outfits. Um, so 1994, I, we only had our professor's office phone all the way until graduate school, really. And that's when I first got my first email, um, my AOL address <laughs> with my dial up. Right. We only had our professor's office phone. So I would call them and I'd leave a message and I'd expect to hear back from them maybe one to four days later on my home phone on the voicemail. Right. right. So the good thing about that was I had to search for the answers myself. It was more effective for me to go, hold on, let me read the syllabus. Let me look for this answer. That's a skill that I think is lost now. But today, students can actually reach their professors really anytime they want. In fact, for me, email is slower for my students than Remind, which is an app that acts like text messaging. And so my students, I will get text messages at three in the morning. Um, it's on silent, but when I wake up at 5.30, I respond back to them. So it's really 24-7 now for students. They can reach out and 
get questions answered immediately, which I think is awesome. Having said that, I think it doesn't force them to go find their own answers sometimes. And they rely on the very easy, I'm going to ask my professor really quickly rather than open up the syllabus or Google this or whatever. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that it's easier, but it still doesn't promote like self-starter habits because listed on an article I read about education technology as one of the pros, social media can ensure full participation, including from shy students who wouldn't normally raise their hands. But the problem I find with that theory is that if a student isn't shy, but really doesn't want to learn or engage at all, it's not really going to help, you know? But that behavior is not really seen in college, kind of like in high school, right? Well, okay, yeah. But there are some students that I've met where it's they're doing it for their parents. Ah, okay. um, but also, I love that it gives shy students a quote-unquote voice. I'm saying that because it's not vocal. But it's important that shy students also, or reserve students, they learn how to speak up. Otherwise, they will be in the workplace and they will be overlooked because they're not speaking up. And I find that people that get laid off are people that, even if they're doing a good job, they're not a voice, you know, and the person making layoff decisions sometimes says, oh, this person, you know, isn't memorable to me. They haven't contributed a lot. And that contribution is based on what they've heard out of them. So I think that it's great for reserve students, shy students, but they also need to learn to vocalize. So what are some ways that you have seen social media negatively affect classrooms? I think that the number one negative effect is it's distracting. It's really distracting. When I was in college, I sat in a classroom and didn't realize the world was going on without me. I really didn't. I didn't have text messaging. So I didn't have my friends texting me and I didn't have the interruption. And my friends were the people around me. Uh Like I, I had to make it that way, right? So, but when you're sitting in the classroom, well, the perception is that everyone else is living this fun, full, life, it's completely demoralizing. You're sitting in this classroom. Let's say you have 500 friends on your social media and you're only seeing maybe 5% of those friends, but you don't see that ratio. All you know is these 5% of people, they're all at Coachella and you are the loser that decided to be the good student Mm. and you're not enjoying this time at Coachella or you're not at the beach or you're not out having that wonderful coffee and breakfast, which is probably all an old picture anyway that just finally posted. So I feel like students are living in this space where their phone is continually lighting up with every other great thing that's happening and they are taken away from the idea that what you're doing right now is the ultimate great thing. This is what's going to lead you to having enough money to go to those concerts, having enough money to go to that fabulous island that you're seeing somebody else at. It's demoralizing because it's distracting. Um, I feel the same way. In all honesty, I have friends that have fabulous corporate jobs. I was Uh going to be a corporate trainer. That's what I went to grad school for. And you know what? I have to walk through Mount Sac. It's not the most beautiful environment. Our classrooms are dirty sometimes. (laughs) They're road hard, right? And um, our bathrooms, I mean, think, this is my life. I have to use these bathrooms all of the time. You know, I'm here till 830 and I've got to use these dirty bathrooms. So I see my friends who are in business meetings with beautiful suits on and and having business lunches and their corporate environment. And even I start questioning my decisions. Like I get distracted. I feel demoralized. I feel like, what did I do? So I get it. But I also realize, you know, I have an awesome job. But I, but you forget about that. It's distracting. So I think that's the big negative in the classroom. I mean, obviously there's some other negatives, like when you get caught. I've had students tell me like family members have died and I've got to go to the funeral and I've announced to the class like, I'm so sorry to say this, but so-and-so can't be here because, you know, they've had a death in their family and I just, maybe their group members can take notes for them today and send them to them and their group members all giggle to each other and they're like, (laughs) this is what he's doing today. And they've flashed a picture of them at, you know, I'll use Coachella and it's like, oh, So that's what's really happening in their lives. So um, I've even honestly have had students tell me stories where I've Googled them or I've gone to social media and I've put their names in Mm -hmm. and I have found out the truth as well. (laughs) Um, A lot of us have done that and it's always enjoyable. Yeah, that happened to me this semester. Uh, I didn't get in trouble, (laughs) but I missed class on Monday with Sherry for intercultural uh, communications. And the next session, she walked past me joking, don't even think about saying you were sick. The funny thing is, basically, I was the one that told her because we have each other on Instagram. What were you really doing? I was at Coachella. Oh. Oh my God. See, it's the perfect example. This is what our students are doing. And it's like, but also employers are finding this out, right? I mean, this is hurting employment too. So um, it's, it's a great way to get caught in the moment you forget that you have all these people as your friends. 
Also, just don't friend your employers. <laughs> Why did you friend your professor? But she's super cool, and she's yeah, probably yeah, fine she with it. Yeah. But you didn't lie to her to begin with. No, no, I just okay. showed up to class. Oh, okay. This yeah. is good. This is good. At least she didn't lie. Yeah, so uh, the negative effects that you mentioned about social media being distracting really support studies done on how it can affect self-perception and mental health. And while some people might say that that's the extent of it, distracting to the person using it, research done by a professor at the University of Michigan shows that technology is actually a distraction for the entire classroom, that laptops distract from learning and affect those around the student, and she believes they should be banned. Meanwhile, another professor says that banning laptops is insulting to students because students are capable of making their own choices, and if they choose to check social media instead of listening to a lecture, that's their loss. And he says it's his responsibility as an educator to ensure that his lecture is compelling, and if his students don't pay attention and they're distracted, then that's on him. So do you think both professors are right to an extent, or do you side more with one than the other? Um, I... I feel both ways, but I don't agree with the reasoning of the professor that thinks that laptops should be allowed. I don't think his reasoning is what I agree with. Uh Um, I've read so many studies, and I'm so glad you brought that up, about students who are distracted from others' devices. And I know that I am also in that same situation when I see other people's devices anywhere I'm at. So I understand that that thinking. I've talked to my students about it and I've asked them, you know, are you distracted by so-and-so's laptop being out right now? I have a student right now in one of my classes. Um, I think he's trading stocks. Either he's like cutting music or trading stocks. It's a screen I'm not familiar with, but I can see others glancing at it because something's going on there and it's very distracting. And I'm constantly saying, please, you know, and he says, oh, I'm taking notes. And he switches the screen. So I have done the thing where I'm like, okay, no laptops, no devices, put them all away. Then I realize I'm robbing students who need them. So there are students who need laptops. So I've played with this. Okay, if you have a laptop or a device you're you're using, can you go to the back row? Well, then I'm also telling students that they have to sit in the back row. I'm assuming their eyesight is good enough to reach the front. I'm kind of like segregating them in a way. So it's such a hard balance. And I don't even know where I sit with it. So these days I tell people, I completely trust you. I think you're genuinely using your laptop for class. But if anyone around this person is distracted by their laptop, please feel free to just move your chair or ask them to, you know, to adjust it in some way. So I don't know. I'm still playing with it. I got to say this, though. It's not my job to tell students to pay attention. Like, I'm glad they showed up. And if our brain needs to kind of reset every 12 to 15 minutes. So if you're listening to a long lecture in about 12 or 15 minutes, you're distracted. That's just a natural rhythm. And for me to be mad at a student for being distracted is like me lying and telling you that I don't do the same exact thing in a long meeting I'm in. I don't do the same exact thing when I'm in, you know, a workshop or whatever. I am. I'm also in college right now, too. I'm getting another degree right now and I get it. I'm the same person, but I chose to show up and maybe I'm doing this because my brain does need to reset. And maybe once I reset my brain, like I need to really probably get up and walk around, but I can't. Once I reset my brain, maybe I'll be a better listener, you know, but then again... If I get on my social media, then I sit there sad that I'm in class, right? Because I see all the fabulous things other people so, are doing. Do you see the same effects with non-college groups, just families or friends or people you people watch? How do you know I'm a people watcher? Um, so <laughs> absolutely. I think we've all seen that meme with the women at the baseball game and they're taking selfies the whole time. If you haven't seen it, it's totally <laughs> worth looking up. Um, it just gives women at baseball game a bad name. But yeah, they spend the entire time just taking selfies. So I do see a lot of that. I actually kind of being aware of this in my own life. I read something that and it was an actual study. They had people go to events, you know, their child's recital, a concert, you know, whatever. And they had them videotape it or not have their phone in their hand at all and gave them surveys on happiness, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And then they asked them for details about the event and the people that had, you know, any device in their hands. They video recorded it. They posted it to social media during the event. They all reported like fewer memories of the actual event. They couldn't restate a lot of what happened. And then also um, less enjoyment from the events. And reading that completely changed how I behave. And at first it was really tough, but now it's very easy. 
So I sit through that one hour production. There will be one this Friday for me of my daughter on stage. I don't videotape a single minute of it. But I find the parent that's still doing it and later ask them to drop that to my phone. And I have the video, but I'm in the moment. I'm enjoying her. And most importantly, she's looking at me knowing I'm connected and I don't have this device in front of me. I go to a concert and I sit and I enjoy it. I don't have to worry about how cute I look in that photo I just took of (laughs) me with the stage behind me, right, to show how close I am, of the picture I've taken zoomed in so it looks like I'm closer to the stage than I am, to brag or show off that I see all these pictures of. I'm just enjoying the $300 I spent to be there and I'm just truly enjoying it. I think that is the biggest problem I see with social media in our everyday lives is we're just completely disconnected. Um... I have to be on my phone sometimes. Mm -hmm. I just have to. I am always working, right? My job never stops. But I try to tell my daughter, hey, I'm going to get on my phone and I'm going to check my email for work because I still have to work, even though I'm sitting here with you. And I I try to tell her what it is that I'm doing so she knows I'm not just disconnecting from her because I'm bored. Um, A lot of times when we're talking, I'll Google something, but I'll tell her, hey, I'm going to Google that. Let's look up more. I'm going to tell you what it is. So I think that we can use it well in our lives We need to make sure it doesn't disconnect us from our lives. And of course, we have the no devices at the dinner table. Yeah. So when you're talking about disconnecting, that kind of goes along with the Psychology Today article I read about texting, Uh where uh, part of the reason why millennials prefer texting is because one is to avoid vulnerable emotions. Oh, yeah. Uh, No one can hear the trembling or the anger in your voice in the text and to protect oneself from having to hear another person's distress, whether it's crying or anger. So this kind of pretty much supports what you're saying about interpersonal interacting being on a like decline yes you know what i get that i get that i have been in a situation where i've had to deliver a difficult message and the first thing i do is go okay how am i going to say this in an email or how am i going to say this in a text and then i go oh my gosh i'm doing it i'm doing the thing we're not supposed to do i'm not being personal with them But it's easier, right? It's an easy cop out. Plus, then I know, too, I'm letting them digest it. So I think, oh, I'm doing them a favor. (laughs) I'm going to let them digest it rather than telling them something bad or, you know, and then having them have to reply back to me. But you know what? We've got to face this. Um, Here's an example. When I met my husband, we met through um, eHarmony which is embarrassing. I was actually on eHarmony doing a communication study, which was fascinating. So I was only on it for three months. And he's like the last guy I met that I was like, (laughs) oh, he seems like we have a lot in common. Um, I was getting off eHarmony, though. I was done with it. And I said, can we just get to know each other through email instead of like this online process? Because I'm done with this. I did my three months. That was the minimum I could do. So we emailed back and forth. And in all honesty, I thought, wow, this guy's really kind of full of himself. He does not give good email. He really doesn't. I just wasn't into him. And I thought back to all the things that were on his profile and how humble he seemed. And I just didn't get the response. I didn't get like over email. I thought this guy was really um, just unkind, maybe arrogant arrogant is the word and so finally when I started like showing disinterest he said can I can we talk can I call you so I gave him my phone number he gives great phone I have told him ever since then never communicate with somebody (laughs) for the first time through email his voice is strong he is humble on the phone he overthinks what he puts in writing and on the phone he's more genuine Mm -hmm. and this is what connected us the minute I heard his voice on the phone I was like Oh, I've got to meet this person. Now, that is the thing. That's the disconnect that people are having. And as students, it's one thing. But what are you going to do when you go into the real world? What are you going to do when you need to connect with somebody in business? Um, Your voice, your presence, you know, that connection, that emotional connection. um, I can't walk away from you right now. Mm -hmm. I can't go. Let me think about what you just said. And process it and then get distracted and not come back to it. I have to respond to you. So we're connected as humans right now. So I think students are going to lose that. And I worry about that. So do you think the younger generation should take a step back and uh, do what makes them uncomfortable? Or do you think older people should make an effort to be more adaptable? Well, both. But um, I think that younger people are more uh, adaptable in general, right? But you got to get uncomfortable. The Mm -hmm. older generation has to get uncomfortable also. Um, Boy, if my mom was on Facebook, she would know so much more about all of her loved ones, right? Mm -hmm. But she just won't do it. Like, she's just like, I don't know. 
you know, that kind of mentality. Um, we have to meet each other in the middle. But in all honesty, who has money? Right. Younger people or older people? Uh, younger people. Right. Uh, oh, no, older people. Older, older people. people. Right. Older people have a lot of money. Those right. baby boomers, they're loaded. Okay, that's a very big stereotype. But let's just assume. Who's hiring? Who who might, like, pass down things to you, like their business or their contracts or, I don't know, their homes if they're your loved ones. But um, younger people and me, all of us, we have to get uncomfortable. We have to strengthen our relationships. Um, there is the best dean I've ever had. His name was Jim Jenkins here at Mount Sac. And I went to his retirement party just a couple years ago, and I thought to myself... I will never be this loved. I cried losing him, and he's just a colleague, right? Um, but because he made me feel safe, he made me feel heard, He all those interpersonal things. And I honestly kind of thought that maybe he and I had this special relationship. But then all these people are walking up to the stage, and they're like, well, Jim and I, we have our special breakfast place. It's a secret I can't tell you. And then somebody else would walk up and go, well... And these are big wigs on campus. These uh-huh. are, you know, it's it's everyone from like more powerful to someone like me that works kind of for him. Uh, well, Jim and I would meet every third Tuesday at our secret lunch place. You know, they all have these. He spent the time to create these special, unique connections to them. So I just saw him a few weeks ago at a conference. He's retired, but he came back for that. And I said, Jim, I have been thinking about you ever since you retired and about how you made these important connections with people and how loved you were. And he said, take the time to connect with people individually. And he said, and start with the people that are the biggest influencers. He made lunch dates, breakfast dates with people that he knew would help navigate him to where he wanted to go. He goes, but then don't ever forget about anyone below you. So we all felt important to him because we had real personal conversations with him. Lunch dates, breakfast dates, meetings in his office. They weren't text messages. They weren't emails. Like he took time to talk in person. If you emailed him, he would say, let's meet, right? Mm -hmm. So it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to do that. But not only was he successful because of it, but people respect, admire, and love him. And he's left a legacy. And it's all just through interpersonal communication, not through, you know, using an app, but because he sat and talked. All right. So uh, I want to wrap up here. We're going to study interpersonal communications that people have had and you fix them. Yes. Have you heard of the overheard accounts on Twitter or Instagram? No. No. Okay. So there's like overheard LA, overheard New York. Okay. Basically, if you overhear someone in public that you think is uniquely cultural to that city, oh. you send it to the account and they'll post it. Okay, that sounds so awesome. I'll read the blue parts. You'll read the green parts and then try to correct the green parts. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. perfect. So person one says, one time I was with this friend and oh, wait, that was you. <laughs> yeah, I figured because you have no other friends. Is there a way to so, make that there's a way to fix this and say, yeah, because we love each other and we spend time together. So, wait, what were you thinking about? Tell me the story. Well, that was good, right? Right, yeah. Okay. Okay, so here's another one. I think you're really great, but I have to stop seeing you. My therapist says you're emotionally unavailable. Um, why do you pay a therapist to tell you that? I would have told you that for free. Oh, uh, okay, so that's <laughs> fun. That's a, I did a guy's voice. Um, so the woman is breaking up with the guy because the therapist says you're emotionally unavailable. By the way, story of my life. I'm so attracted to emotionally unavailable people. <laughs> I literally meet them and I'm like, I will make you love me. Mm-hmm. This is the story of my life. I'm surprised I don't have cats. So uh, how would I fix this? I would say um, a guy that's hearing that doesn't even get it. So if they were emotionally available, they would say something. Oh, God, I, I, can you fix it? I just think she should run. The guy <laughs> should say exactly like, uh, okay, so do you want to go back to my place and chill? Because that's exactly what he probably is going to say. Okay. There's no fixing this. So I'm so, no fixing I'm so okay. proud of this girl. Run, girl, run. <laughs> okay. Um, drunk girl talking to her married <laughs> friends. I'm just upset because I feel like you think I'm pathetic because I'm not married yet. <sighs> Honestly, Natasha, I'm not trying to be a bitch, but... Literally, we never even think about you. So Natasha is a narcissist, clearly. And so I like that Natasha's like, oh, my God, you're thinking about me so much and you think this, right? Here's a way to fix it. So 
because her friend really isn't being a bitch. She's being honest. Uh-huh. Natasha, that is not something that even goes through our mind. Without even saying, because we don't think about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Natasha's a narcissist. They should stop hanging out with her. Last one. Husband says... Please forgive me for, like, speaking my truth, but it's just that you're always trying to tell me what not to do. And I've been trying to stay more positive lately, so would it be okay if you just say what you need me to do instead? Um, okay. I need you to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a way to say that positively? Okay, so here's here's positive. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to really frame this positive because um, I am very impressed with the husband. More people need to say that to their spouse or whoever is in their life. Um, I heard you. I hear what you're saying. Let me think about it for a while. I'm going to go take a moment. And I will try to come back with a list of things that are awesome about you. Wouldn't that be ideal? But that is hilarious. These are real things that people have heard yeah. people say. Okay, these people that are coming back with these responses are so witty. I love it. All right, so uh, that's pretty much it. Daniel, that was so much fun. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. 